The government wants to raise the school leaving age to 18. That's the big idea at the heart of yet another proposed shake-up in secondary education that includes more personalised learning and new diplomas. So, was Tomlinson right after all? That's the question for this big debate. <laughs> Hello and welcome to The Big Debate. The government wants to extend compulsory education and training to the age of 18. Raising expectations, the new green paper, says that by 2013 every 16 to 18 year old must be at school, in college or in training. Those who don't comply could risk ending up in court. It's part of a package of reforms designed to fix the chronic ailments that bedevil post-16 education. Disenchantment with learning, high dropout rates, a vocational training system underexploited and undervalued. It is a very serious problem. Every year, nearly a quarter of 16-year-olds turn their backs on education and training altogether. Some find work, but over 200,000 of them leave school with no jobs and no prospects. The Green Paper talks about re-engaging young people like these through personalised learning. But it's unclear whether this means more individual tuition, extended school hours, or a more flexible timetable, or all three. It talks about a new set of vocation-friendly diplomas to run alongside GCSEs and A-levels, but it remains unclear if students can mix and match the two sets of qualifications. The Green Paper also advocates more work experience and on-the-job training achieved through greater collaboration between employers and educators. But it remains unclear who will shape the content and style of the courses. To many, it sounds like the reforms put forward in the 2004 Tomlinson report. Tomlinson also proposed a diploma, but his would have blended the academic and vocational in a single syllabus designed to replace A-levels and GCSEs. At the time, the idea caused a storm among parents and employers. Both feared the diploma would herald a drop in standards. The government responded by saying that GCSEs and A-levels were safe in its hands. So, are these reforms in effect? Tomlinson Mark II, but this time backed by compulsion. Joining me are key figures at the very heart of this important debate, including the school's minister, Jim Knight, and an audience equally involved, but I suspect with very diverse views. Minister, compulsion for 16, 17, 18-year-olds, really? Right at the end of the line, yes, because if you're going to have this policy of increasing the participation age uh, to 18, then you need some teeth at the end of it. But really, if we get to the point of having to force people against their will, then we failed them, not that they failed us. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of this is about making education much more engaging all the way through secondary school and, uh, and then on post-16 as well. John Hayes, the Conservatives, what's your reaction well, to the thought of compulsion in this context? You've got to be able to make education attractive to young people, as Jim said. And we've got 55,000 children every day playing truant. We've got uh, now 1.3 million young people between the age of 16 and 24 not in education, employment and training. The education system is failing a very large number of young people. If you can't engage people up to the age of 16, the chances of engaging them up to the age of 18, unless you radically rethink what you provide for them, make it relevant, make it purposeful, uh, make it something which excites and inspires them, Really, this is a non-starter. So compulsion is out from your perspective? No, it's not, uh, not a matter of compulsion being out, but I think Jim's right that compulsion uh, is not something you would first look to. You'd look to a curriculum which inspired and encouraged and engaged people. OK. You can't do that. This debate about compulsion is frankly irrelevant. Uh, uh, Alison Wolfe, of course, there was a great deal of fuss about compulsion when the school leaving age was raised from 15 to 16. Does it matter if you get the right environment, whether or not you compel at the age of 17, 18? If qualifications are worth having, then they will stay for them. If the qualifications on offer to 17-year-olds are not worth having, and many of them have no labour market value, then it seems to be perfectly reasonable that they shouldn't stay on. And one of the things which it's also worth bearing in mind is they're currently paid to stay on, so they really must want not to. 
Okay, well, I'm going to pick. I will pick up on, on on some of these things. I want I want to bring in our audience and specifically, first of all, um, uh, some teachers. W what do you make of the idea of uh, compulsion, um, Ian Ashman? Personally, I would rather not have compulsion. I would rather have people engaged because they want to be there. But uh, I do think there's a big gap currently that we have to fill if we're going to meet the needs of everyone who's 16, 17 and 18. Chris Pierce, another teacher in the back row. <clears throat> I think we're in danger of recreating a problem that we've solved between 14 and 16. <clears throat> Um, we now use many local education suppliers, further education colleges and a wide range of uh, education suppliers to uh, deal with disaffected young people between the ages of 14 and 16. And if at the end of that programme you suddenly say to them that they're compelled to come back to school for two more years, I can just imagine the sort of middle digit of fellowship being extended to many schools by those very young people. Mick Brooks, you represent a very senior bunch of teachers. How do you reckon they will judge in this context, uh, compelling at the end of the day young people who are 16, 17 and 18 to stay on school. We've heard two views there. Yeah, um, my colleagues are pretty concerned about this uh, and it's um, the, the, the concept of, of um, young people staying on in education is absolutely right. It's the practicality as to how we get there which is important. And um, John, I agree with you, there has to be a curriculum that uh, young people engage with and we have to put a stop to um, this sort of castigating uh, young people at every year end uh, with, with league table results because if these young people and, and their teachers and their schools and their communities are being judged as failures um, at 7 and 11 and 14, it's no wonder that they're going to vote with their, with their feet. Paris and the audience, you did vote with your feet. You left at 16. <laughs> what made you decide to leave? Why did you say, no, I'm getting out of here? Just because um, my school was really going downhill. We've got new headmasters there now, but um, all of this, one of my teachers tried to commit suicide. All the other teachers, they couldn't be bothered. We were filled with supply teachers. Um, hardly anyone was really looking to pass, and it wasn't really just our fault. But Did, did you want in, independence from the institution, or was it you didn't like the institution? Or did you want to be on your own, choosing your own path? Well, I didn't think I had much choice in my own path. Um, and, yeah, that's basically it, really. But with what you lot are talking about, I think that if you lot was to bring GCSEs um, to when you lot are talking about 18 or whatever, or have the choice of whether the student wants to do them at 16 or when they're 18, it would bring more passes, basically, because when they're 16, they don't really know what they want and everything, and if you lot are bringing it up to 18, you lot should be, like fixing the curriculum differently to how it would be set before. Simon, ne next door, you left at 16 as well. Yeah. What made you say, I'm not going to stay on? Um, same reason. I think a lot of the teachers, a lot of, not, a, a good majority of teachers are, are really there to have a job. and aren't really, don't really have the passion that maybe they used to have in the, in the job that they do because uh, probably about 70 percent of my teachers in the end just like towards year 11, beginning, end of year 10, year 11. So, so were you just sort of hacked off with it, bored? Yeah, pretty much. But by, by the big, middle of year 10, I just weren't really bothered by it anymore. I knew that I needed the GCSEs to carry on, but didn't see that it was worth all the trouble that I was going in at school. Minister, at, at the end of the, of the road, you say only at the end of the road, is, is compulsion. Um, does that mean failure to comply at the end of the road is an offence that does take you to court. That could, if you don't pay a fine, end up with you, as has happened in other similar kinds of cases, being uh, found guilty of a criminal offence. We're talking about it in very similar terms to the responsibility that parents have towards their children getting education up to the age of 16, except we wouldn't apply it to parents. Uh, that's the proposal that it would apply to the learner instead. And parents can receive an attendance order from a magistrate's court if things go really badly wrong. And if they don't comply with that, then that, in turn, might become a criminal offence. If you are 16, mm. as everyone always says, you can go into the armed forces. More particularly, you can say, I want to get married. Yep. I want to have children. Isn't it odd in the 21st century that a government then comes along and says, we are going to erode your freedom to this extent, unlike all other people who are in a position to have families and children, you are going to stay in one form or another in education or training? Well, for the learner's sake, if they're going to uh, progress in life and in the economy, uh, then 
they will certainly benefit from getting the extra qualification that uh, the equivalent of GCSEs, what, what we call uh, level twos, w would get them uh, up to the age of 18. But for the economy's sake, uh, we know that in 2004 there were 3.2 million unskilled workers. In 2020 there will only be 0.6 million. There simply won't be the work for them to do. Ah, so it's a sort of make-work scheme. It's, a, it's a keep the unemployment figures down. No, but the economy very clearly needs to increase the level of skill that we have at the moment because we're not going to have uh, the work for those people. Makes sense, Alison Wolf. What's your response to that? I think it's outrageous. I think it's absolutely outrageous to tell people to stay on, to do something that they see no point in doing. As you say, they can get married, they can hold down a job, they can have a family, and yet they're being told they've got to turn up to an institution at which they may well feel they're being taught absolutely nothing of any value, and they may well be right. One more thing on this, uh, Minister. What would the, the Alan Sugars, the Richard Bransons and the Philip Greens uh, make of the fact that you would require or would have required them to stay on at school until they're 18 when they left at 16 without qualifications and, on the whole, haven't exactly been failures in life? No, and uh, Alan Johnson's Secretary of State equally left school at 15. Uh, and he had not, to go through the same thing. We're not requiring them to stay at school. They can go to work, they can be trained at work by their employer. Yeah, they can't go off and say, I want to be an entrepreneur, can they, by myself and make my own way in the world? Um, no, uh, they would have to do some kind of training for some of the time. Let me then bring in, you touched on uh, the, the Alan Shugness, we've got one or two employers um, in our audience. Alan, Adam Hildreth? Adam Hildreth, a young employer. I would, well, I left school at 16, what, six years ago now, and I would have been one of the people in the magistrate's court, to be honest. Um, I got told by the business studies teacher that I had that the only way you could run a successful business was to go and get A-levels and a degree. I had a very good idea at the time, and it's turned out to be an extremely good idea, and I've carried on, I'm now my second business. Um, the fact that, I think that, the fact is not how long you stay on at school, it's the fact that the education system at the moment does not teach the core skills, it's not teaching a way that people can learn. The way that I would have been, well, the way I have learnt business from people that do it on a day-to-day -day basis, people that have gone out there and make money, um, and they've taught me through networking and everything else how to do that. That's how the education system needs to change. It's not about keeping people on longer. It's about giving the people access to people that they can actually learn from, aspirational business figures, everything else. That's the problem here, not forcing people to stay on. And, and, and here's a guy who's... You've made it, I presume. Um, a, or are making it, yes. <laughs> yeah, still making it, And, yeah. and he, he'd be in the courts. He'd be, you know, profound but, but embarrassment to the system, wouldn't he? There's the whole side of this that we're not talking about yet um, that addresses what Adam's talking about, which is uh, the changes that we want to make to the whole of the education system that we are making to the education system to make it more engaging, to offer more qualification choice, sort of thing that Paris was talking about earlier on, so that people... Uh, are more engaged, they want to carry on learning in some form, be it in the workplace, uh, be it by popping into college for um, a few hours every week or staying Aren't on you, at school. You, you, John Hayes. Well, I think it's true to say that we need to provide opportunities for people to be, get skilled. Uh, we know from a number of surveys that we are relatively poorly skilled compared with some of our uh, our principal competitors. So we certainly need to provide people with opportunity and we need to make those opportunities as attractive as possible right through people's working life, not just actually at 17, right through their working life to reskill and upskill because it's good for them and it's good for the economy. However, I'm not sure the way to do that is to lead this with compulsion. I think you lead it by making the curriculum attractive, engaging you're having, you see, you're having, and meaningful. You're having it both ways. The Minister has said compulsion at the end of the day, but of course we're going to make it much less likely that people will reach that stage because they will be more engaged, more enthusiastic. Yeah. You're having it both ways. You're saying um, don't like compulsion, but we've got to do exactly otherwise, effectively, what the Minister's saying, make it much better. No, I, 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 wouldn't, may have I wouldn't have initiated the debate about compulsion. I would have initiated debates, as I've tried to do, about the uh, the kind of engagement, the kind of meaningful, purposeful training. OK. Now, now, the minister has chosen to frame this debate around the issue of compulsion. I think that, in a sense, colours it the wrong way. OK. The plan for extending compulsory education and training to 18 rests, as we've just been trying to touch on, heavily on one thing, that's making it interesting. The Green Paper talks about re-engaging students through personalised learning, that's code for small group tuition, and flexible timetabling. Ta Let's take a brief look at what this could mean in practice. In this clip from a Teachers TV documentary, two recalcitrant 13-year-olds in Brighton are attending a science tutorial. It's part of a scheme to get disruptive children back to school. The frustration in the room, as you'll see, is almost palpable. Tom is 13 years old. After several exclusions, he rarely turns up at school. 
Tom's friend Daniel is also 13. He hasn't been to school for two years. Daniel, I think it'd be a good idea if you stood up and did it over there, yeah? I don't want orange, fizzy orange, all over here, so... No, pure orange juice. Hmm. Pure. pure. Not fizzy. No, but could you just go and stand up and drink it over there? Just it. So, just in case you spill it. Hello. Right, Tom, how are you doing? Good, fine. Where are you doing? Doing all right now? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm doing all right, thank you. <laughs> right, now, why are you... Tom's... Have you nearly finished, Tom? <coughs> right. Now, I want you to think about how we can measure the space well, inside a box. OK, that'll do. Right. So, how do we find out the volume of these boxes? Get a measure. Yeah, now you've done the measuring, so you've now got to do a little bit of a sum. What sum do we do? Oh, three, three and three. Yeah, we've got to measure. We've got to do something to get the answer as centimetre cubes. And I make that the width. I hit a teacher on the arse with a ruler. I tip paint on the teacher's head. Because some of the teachers were annoying and they used to tell me what to do. I don't like being told what to do. One of you have got to light the candle oh. and then very gently you've got to put the jar on top. Can I just show you? Yeah, I know. Like, I, done yeah. It yesterday, I know you did, but Dan didn't. Right. Now, before we do this, I think it might be an idea if you two take a five minute break, OK? Yeah, I've got a fact. Just go and get some fresh air. <laughs> I want to be a footballer. Who do you want to play for? Liverpool. Well, what do I want to do? Be a plumber. That's personalised learning in Brighton. It's actually rather sad to look at. Mm. Um, uh, Minister, those are obviously very challenging cases, um, but they're by no means unique. And the, don't know about those particular two, but the chances are they're the sort who will leave at the age of 16. You're talking the so-called neets, the kids mm -hmm. at the bottom end, 200 and plus thousand. Are you intending to give them the same degree of personalised teaching as those two are getting and put the resources there as well? Well, uh, a ratio of one teacher to two pupils, I think, is uh, a little ambitious, even at the uh, accelerated level of funding. What are you talking about? I mean, in terms of the numbers, because obviously that's crucial to give that sort of attention. Mm. Are you talking three, four, five, six, a dozen? What, what sort of we're, numbers, given the class sizes you have at the moment? We're still talking similar sort of class sizes, but you've got the, um, the catch-up and stretch classes that you might have after school through uh, extended schools, um, and the use of teaching assistants in smaller groups uh, led by the classroom teacher to be able to uh, deliver more personalised learning. Uh, 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 Mick Brooks, I mean, it, you've heard that it's the same kind of class sizes. You're mm. talking about kids 16, 17, mm. maybe with similar attitudes, unless mm. they get very effective mm. personalised uh, teaching. It's a tall order, isn't it, for them? It is a tall order, and, and uh, research shows that uh, personalised learning, call it that if you want, but certainly personalised attention uh, for young people at schools is, is very important. I'm going to pick up Simon, who's talked about passion for teaching. And I think that's what we need to do. We, we, we appear to have um, quite a lot of teachers who, who, have, who has, as Simon has said, has lost that passion. Because we've got a sort of mechanised curriculum, we've got a curriculum which is based on tests and assessment all the time, and we need to free uh, young people up from that and give them something that, um, that certainly, you know, the skills of reading and writing and ICT and all of those things are very important, but they have to have a really practical curriculum. And I'm not just talking about people who aren't necessarily academic. Mm -hmm. This has got to go right across the board, and that's what Tomlinson did so successfully. Michael Jones up at the, the, the back here. Um, you left, am I right, you left earlyish as well from school? Yeah. If you had what you've just been hearing about, personalised attention or personalised learning, do you think that would have made a difference to your readiness to stay on if you had closer personal attention or not? I, f I think not. I think that's just... Um, then it's like you're, you're, you're dividing the the young people in school, you're trying to say, I need more attention than other people in the school. So I think it's not about the attention, it's more about the learning and what 
I think the government are not getting is learning is not just maths, English and science, it's more than that. It's more about, you know, I learn on the streets where I walk, if you get what I mean. Learning is everywhere you are. So I think what they need to, you know, they're trying to, they're saying making learning exciting. How can you make learning exciting when you don't want to bring in other things that's not got to do with academics in the school? We're going to come on to exactly that point in, in just a minute, but just before we, we, we do, um, John Hayes, you're not again the concept of personalised learning. If it's a kind of return to the ploughed and bourgeois liberal child-centred claptrap that is so much damage to education in schools for 25 years, then I would oppose it tooth and nail, because good teachers, and Mick knows this very well, have always used a variety of teaching and learning methodologies because that is the nature of good teaching. We don't, they don't need to be told that's not what they have to do, but equally, let's be fair to them and not suggest that they've got to design a curriculum for 30 different children and then somehow make that work, because it won't work. D does anyone want to speak up for uh, what the Shadow Minister calls liberal child-centred clap trap or to interpret that in a different way from how he does? Uh, I was a Plowden teacher and I'll tell you what, the poetry I got from children at that time by opening up the curriculum was, was absolutely fantastic. Those children in my class, by having a curriculum that wasn't about uh, doing comprehensive exercises all the time, but actually by going out and, and, and um, looking at real life and writing poetry, those children loved writing. Now we've got a real problem with writing, uh, particularly at Key Stage mm. 2, because it's mechanised. And, and whilst, of course, you need grammar and punctuation, what you need to drive that is the love of the subject. And that's not just writing. You're quite right. It's not just writing. It's whatever you're doing in school. It's about history. It's uh, about geography. It's uh, about all of those things. Well, you take us directly to them with what learning is and what you are going to be teaching, as well as how you teach, because, of course, the question is not only how you teach, but what you teach. That's the new diploma. More on that in a moment. Welcome back to the big debate. As well as raising the school leaving age in effect, the government wants to introduce a new post-16 qualification, the diploma. If all goes according to plan, the first five diplomas will come online in September 2008. A further nine will be rolled out, as they like to say, by 2013. The subjects on offer have a distinctly vocational flavour. That's in the first tranche. Construction, media, engineering, IT. So what are new diplomas going to be like? One possible template is the vocational GCSE that was introduced in some parts of the country in 2002. Laced Dyke Enterprise College is in an inner-city area of Bradford in West Yorkshire. In 2004, Deputy Head Rob Roebuck made a radical decision. He took traditional geography off the school's syllabus and replaced it with the new vocational GCSE in leisure and tourism. The students are motivated to being on a very practical competence-based course uh, that gets them out of the classroom, that works with industry, that we can take all the opportunities outside the classroom. And for me personally, it's, it's very satisfying teaching a course where I can get my students out in real situations and teach them real skills. To get his pupils the real-world experience, Rob forged a partnership with the Midland Hotel in Bradford. It's a four-star hotel catering for a business market, employing around 60 staff. Effectively, young children, 14, 16 years of age, they're, they're, they're our future staff. It's a fantastic way of introducing kids uh, to the hotel, to the industry, give them a good background of um, what it's all about. They can then make an informed decision as to whether they may want to do this as a career as and when they leave school. For this assignment, Unit 3, Customer Service in Leisure and Tourism, it's very important that the assignment is driven by a real location. I have to go through the building blocks of knowledge in the classroom. Uh, we can't be out of the classroom all the time, it's impossible. But whenever I can, it's important to get them out of that classroom and them to be able to experience real situations. We need to dress in proper, clean and well-presented uniforms. Be properly groomed with the correct levels of makeup and not too much jewellery. Men, be well groomed and clean shaven. 
What actions would you take to a member of staff if he didn't have the desired uniform on? So we need, we need to make sure that our management and supervisory staff look after the staff to make sure they don't look like a dog's dinner. If they do, you get sent home. The importance of the question and answer session is that they've had the presentation, they've taken key messages from that presentation from Gary, and they're starting to link it with their learning in the classroom. If you enjoy something, you learn it. It's, it, it's, it's better than having a pen and a paper, um, because you, um, cause you're more interactive and you're active as well. We spend a lot of time ringing up, exploring opportunities, building the scenarios, uh, taking the, the pupils out on these experiences. Very, very time consuming. But the time it takes is rewarding because obviously their experiences are brought back into the classrooms and you see that in the quality of the work. So there's a vocational GCSE in operation in Bradford offering a possible vision of the future diploma. If the new diploma, John Hayes, is going to be like that, it offers, would you say, a pragmatic, realistic way of dealing with a practical problem? Yeah, I think the diplomas in principle are a very good thing. I think it is important that we provide a pathway on the vocational side of education which matches the clear pathway that's available to academic uh, orientated young people. However, and I must introduce two caveats really, Jonathan, mm -hmm. the first is that as the Select Committee reported recently, there are real doubts about the introduction timetable, about the consistency across the diplomas in terms of rigour and quality, and indeed how much employers have been involved in shaping them. Some they have, some less so. So I think there is a real risk that they may, in the Secretary of State's own words, go horribly wrong. Jim Knight, what is the status of this new diploma? Is it clearly going to be vocational in the terms in which we all understand today the concept of vocational? No, it's a mix of the sort of motivation that you were seeing there from learners in Bradford enjoying learning through doing and strong academic content. We want these to be chosen by learners of all abilities. We have the traditional vocational route that we're expanding, the apprenticeship route. Uh, you know, we've gone from 80,000 now to a quarter of a million. We'll go up <laughs> to 400,000 uh, by uh, 2013. Uh, we have the strong academic traditional option of GCSEs, A-levels, and now the International Baccalaureate. And a mix of the two is the diplomas developed with employers through the sector skills councils. Um, and uniquely, the starting point was what employers wanted. Um, uh, but with functional skills built in, with personal learning and thinking skills, with an extended project, trying to build the employability skills, which we're told uh, are missing too often from learners when they leave so, education. So you would be able to take, am I right, um, a GCSE, an A-level and a diploma. You could do all of those, or one of them, or two of them. We would envisage that uh, uh, up to 16, the, the diploma would occupy a, around three days of the timetable. Will they be seen as, um, uh, as equal to doing uh, GCSEs? Could you go from doing the diplomas, because that's what you like at that mm -hmm. time, and then say, now I'd like to do some A-levels? You could. We certainly wouldn't want people to be trapped into a decision at 14. They've got to be allowed to make, if you like, the wrong decision or change their mind um, at 16 and then be able to move from... Uh, diploma to A level from indeed GCSE to doing a level three diploma, a post 16 um, stage of diploma. How, how, how would these diplomas be um, unique in respect of in engaging employers and bringing employers together with students in a way that doesn't already happen? Because the employers have been involved in designing them in the first place. What does that place. mean? Have they, so, have, have they said you want this? Yes, you can have it. No. Uh, right at the outset, we've said, if we were to devise this new f sort of qualification, what sort of skills and what sort of learning do you want to be included in the qualification? So the engineering one, which is starting in September, Rolls-Royce, for example, have been involved with us in developing that one alongside Cambridge University to make sure we got the academic side right. Um, Motorola, the BBC, uh, you know, some of the so blue-chip names like, so is in our bit, economy have been involved in designing these from the word go. But if you are a, a pupil and you go on one of these diploma courses. Is it sort of like taster courses? You get a little bit of this, a little bit, of, oh, I don't like that one, I like that one, but you're learning in the process about the world of work, or is it like an apprentice is apprenticeship is designed to do to equip you for a particular job? Yeah, and an apprentice is occupational specific. These are specific to a whole industry, so they're not going to equip you with, if you're doing construction, they're not going to equip you to be a bricklayer or an architect. 
uh, but they will give you an understanding of the built environment and the way uh, these buildings are put together. But do the in this diploma, you can elements. sort of float through quite a lot. And you know, that's, a little, that's quite interesting, quite interesting in the construction industry. Actually, now I got fed up with the construction industry. I think I'll try tourism. Actually, the media is quite interesting. Why don't I think about that? If you were to choose the creative and media diploma from uh, next September, and that's taking up three days of your week, um, we've said that no individual institution would be able to deliver it on their own. So the chances are you would be doing some of your learning in your base school and then you'd be doing some learning in a college, you'd be doing some learning in a workplace. Um, you don't have the ability to then switch to construction and the built environment the following week uh, because you've committed to that course and you're doing some specific skills to that sector, you're doing some generic learning, um, you would then in, in, in time be doing some uh, additional learning that you would choose and, and take some options um, and you would have some work experience built into that as well. It's a lot better, Alison Wolf, than having people sitting around really fed up if they get engaged in the way that the minister supposes they, they would. I mean, the sense that they will be happier doing this than doing what's on offer at the moment, which they're free to walk away from. Um, I think that it's absolutely right that we are trying to redesign the curriculum, particularly, I think, post-16 in terms of offering new options. Um, I do also think that the real problems that the government is having with the diploma underlines how difficult it is to do something major and new and also underlines the danger of being over-ambitious and trying to do everything at one time. You say you started with the employers, but it isn't an occupational qualification. And, and so there is this, this continuing lack of clarity about what exactly it is. But that we do need something other than A-levels, that's clearly true. But um, when you say there's lack of clarity, he hasn't ministered and made it clear. Is it clear to you, Mike? Um, <laughs> I think, there's, I, I think what, what, what Jim is saying is that there has to be a mix. The real danger is that if we're not careful with this, we're going to throw the curriculum back to the 1950s and we're going to have a curriculum for the non-academic and we're going to have a curriculum for uh, people who, who have always wanted to and, and will go to university. And that would be a, a huge social mistake. And so finding that mix of practical skills uh, linked with, with an engaging uh, curriculum, which, which of course uh, leads to improved communication, uh, numeracy skills, and, and actually what young people do far better than we do, ICT is very, very important. Yeah, yeah, but the point about being a plumber or a carpenter or a network engineer is of course you have to be able to read and write, of course you have to be able to uh, count and numerate. I mean, that's an implicit part of those skills. So we shouldn't be frightened of calling these vocational, trying to academicise them. Too often, vocational but, but qualification and academicised really... because we're frightened of the idea that there can be competencies and accomplishments which deliver real satisfaction that are about craft. Why are we so frightened um, of that? Well, we can deliver craft through apprenticeships. It's really important that learners see these as a route to university as well as a route into employment. That That's correct. Bournemouth University's media school, a world-leading media school, will want to take people on with the creative and media diploma that um, any of our leading universities Only would want to so, 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 engineering so, so, undergraduates so, so, with sorry, just, engineering just, just absolutely clear. If you did the diploma mm. and you, in, in that course, um, and you've done well in it, you can go straight into a university uh, course uh, on the back of it. That's the, that's the aspiration for Absolutely. it. Absolutely, that's the way it's being designed. Let, let me ask, bring in some employers and teachers here. Um, John Guy is a teacher. What, what's your thought about the diploma? The, the problem with the diploma as I see it is that, so to speak, it starts at 14. The two lads we saw on television were 13. And, and we're not going to turn them on in, on in education at the age of 14, 15 if they've already been turned off. Mm -hmm. So there has to be a whole curriculum approach to this, and it doesn't start at key stage four, mm -hmm. it starts earlier, mm -hmm. so that the youngsters who are making their choices at the age of 13, 14, what they're going to do key stage four, are making those choices not because, so to speak, they failed at the academic -y things, so let's try something different, but rather they might choose something at which they've already succeeded to take on. And do, I think that's crucial. Do, do you think, given that, that in principle, if you have um, a diploma course of the kind that the minister has outlined, that can lead straight to a university degree course, that that is a, that that is a good? Oh, I've, I mean, of course it can. Yeah. And I think when one looks at the uh, diplomas as they've been specified so far, then one can see that they will. But look, if you do the creative and media diploma, 
you won't be able to go on to university to do, you know, science or engineering. Of course not. Mm. These are appropriate courses for appropriate progression. Mm -hmm. uh, Julia Dow, do you play rather a key role in this process in your organisation? Um, what do you make of the diplomas in the way in which they've been described? Can you help deliver those against a background where some people are rather uh, sceptical about the capacity of vocational training at the moment and think it's rather in a mess? Yeah, I think it's a really helpful development because our job is to make sure that for every young person from the age of 14, and actually we style this as reducing the school leaving age to 14 and offering young people a pathway, making sure that there is... The but isn't that just spin? No, not at all. Absolutely not you at all. You could reduce it to five, couldn't you, and say after five you're a student, you're at a young university. <laughs> no, this is, about, this is about making the choice. And you, you, your, your phraseology there, young university, one of the most successful things we've been doing is putting in place young apprenticeships from 14. These are working with employers, incredibly successful. We worked with Land Rover with 30 young people. They wanted us to have 300 young people this year. So young people are being inspired. The lad that we saw who was being asked to calculate the volume of the cardboard box, if he'd had a conversation about how would you order your materials for being a plumber, that would really have inspired him and got him to a line of sight to his employment. Any other thoughts on this who would like to, who would like to come in on this? Yes. I've got um, just three points. I think. You, uh, give us one of them. I will give you <laughs> certainly one of them. And I think that the first one would be the logistics of it, because, mm. like the school minister said, uh, you're talking about you know, young you know, pupils here going from one base to another base. And, and to me, I think logistically it's, it's going to be a nightmare because then who's going to be, you know, um, taking these pupils from one site to five miles down the road to a college to do another part of the diploma and so forth. So logistically, this is going to be very, very difficult to manage. Any other thoughts on this who would like to, would like to come in on this? I've always had a, um, an issue with this ish the idea of vocational and academic. This is about a context for learning, and it's about learning very academic things in a different context. Absolutely. And people respond to that very effectively, whatever their level of understanding. And I, I think the sooner we can get to providing a range of contexts for learning, whether they be in the workplace, in the school, or wherever, I think we'll get there. Yeah. We shouldn't be bullied and by the word or. We can have both. We can have academic and vocational and, and change the learning style uh, and improve Let, let me just bring in from right. who've been listening carefully to this, who left school at the age of 16, who said maybe things could get better. Simon. Um, so no, I'm, I'm on a voc vocational course myself, and I think a lot of the people that would choose to do a vocational course would rather not have the academic side of it on the course, because that, I don't know, I don't know, I think the way the, the way the youths are now, we just are lazy, I think a lot of us are very, very lazy, and would rather do something with our hands and do something running about or something like that than go sit down and write something, write something and read something. Uh, uh, Michael, at the back, you were shaking so, your head. If you want to do something, you know, you don't need to stop everything that's working right now, just improve on the people that are not achieving so well and just work with the younger ones to inspire them for, from primary school age so they can develop themselves to be a better person. OK, Mick Brooks. I think that picks up John's point very well and 14 is too late. By that time, a lot of young people are disillusioned with, with what they've had in education and it needs to start uh, an awful lot earlier. It's the practical details though, that we've got to work out. How do you possibly get all that into school? And we've got some good ideas here. So much better you know, if you're going into plumbing but you need to work out how many metres of copper pipe you need to order okay. uh, and those sorts of things. All of which leads us to the next question. Can the new diplomas in the context of extending compulsory education and training to 18 deliver what the teachers, the employers, students, pupils and indeed the government all want? I say that because it's not at all clear that they want the same thing. We'll explore that in a moment. Welcome back to the big debate. As we've been discussing, the Green Paper, called Raising Expectations, proposes a new set of post-16 diplomas that are intended, at least, to be vocation-friendly. But can they both meet the needs and challenges identified by secondary school educators and, at the same time, deliver what employers want as well? In short, is this a circle that can be squared? Uh, Mick Brooks, a lot of people 
believe there has to be parity of esteem, as the, the phrase goes. You're with Tomlinson. I'm right that you think there has to be, if it's going to work in reality, it has to blend academic with vocational to be effective? I think that's right. Uh, and one of the good things about the diploma is that where quite a lot of young people uh, leave school today with, with actually nothing to show for all their years there, the diplomas um, are bite-sized. And so um, all young people can leave with something, some aspect of it. Um, but I, I think there's a, there's, a, there's a culture in this country which needs to be broken, which is that you sneer at the artisan and you think that people who are academic and go to university are, are, are wonderful. Uh, and I, I think we've got to break that Do you think people do culture. sneer at artisans? I, th I believe they do. Um, you know, he's only a, or she's only a. And I think that's, that's, uh, that's quite wrong. Are you saying, in effect, that if this doesn't end up as Tomlinson, as the blending, then this diploma is not going to achieve the objective that it sets itself? I, I think what Tomlinson almost magically did was, was get sign-up from uh, higher education, from universities, from schools. Um, and unfortunately, um, the, the parents and the employers seem to be missed out uh, in that debate. But it, it is about signing up. It is about making sure um, that the diplomas are uh, respected by higher education, by university, and in order to do that, I think we need to clear the ground a little uh, with all the other opportunities that there are. And I, I'm just interested to see how um, GMVQs, for instance, are going to stand up against the diploma. And the other thing is, of course, we, we've been talking here about education for employment. I think education is far bigger than that. And education is about, and um, lifelong education and lifelong learning is about actually living a fulfilled life. And so many people are trapped into living unfulfilled lives because they haven't been able to take advantage of, of the education and offered. John Hayes, isn't that exactly where this divide comes? Because the, the diploma um, allows for a, use the word, holistic approach, which employers in the end aren't interested in. What is wrong with what Mick Brooks has proposed, which you were very sharply again. Well, no, I'm not against... I mean, I'm very strongly in favour of the idea of elevating the practical. I do think we should value craft, as I said earlier. I think that there are all kinds of competences which have had low social, economic and cultural status in our country that should have very high status. But in terms of the diploma, to be more specific, it's very important the diploma is legitimately and rigorously vocational. Now, of course, that will involve the imparting some academic skills, because, as I said earlier, some of those things are implicit in the acquisition of vocational competence. But it must have a rigour, a clarity, so that employers say, someone who's been through this route, who's got a diploma, is going to have some real skills that are valuable in the marketplace, but, and I agree with Mick on this too, also gives them a sense of worth, mm. of personal he wants worth to, and value. But he wants to blend... You'll correct me. He wants to blend the academic and the vocational so mm. that the distinction is effectively eroded for the benefit of society more broadly than whether or not you can get a job. Yeah. You're against that, yes? Yeah, I'm, I'm against it because what I've seen with vocational qualifications over a very long time is that they've been academicised. I mentioned apprenticeships earlier. Too many apprenticeships now have been detached from the workplace. Not all of them. Some are very much uh, employer-based and skills-based still. But some now are largely taught, you know, in the classroom are not in the workplace. And the same with some of the other uh, vocational qualifications that become tick box tests rather than the teaching and testing of real vocational competencies. I don't want to see the diplomas academicised because I think it will lower their value and esteem and I think employers will cease to recognise them and value them in the way I want them to. You've got, Minister, as a government, a political problem with this because if you blend the diploma with GCSEs, um, and A-levels, your claim that uh, these exams, GCSEs and A-levels, are safe in your hands will start to sound very hollow to a key sector of the electorate. I don't, I don't see that. Um, I sketched out earlier uh, the need for qualification choice and that we are describing a choice between a traditional academic route, the GCSE A-level International Baccalaureate route, a traditional um, vocational apprenticeship route, and then a blended route, which is the diploma. Uh, and that, that gives blended choice. route, which is going to be, from your point of view, extremely important and can lead, lead theoretically at least to a university mm, degree, yes. is precisely, isn't it, where people will start to say, hang on, 
This is downgrading of the of the A level. They're making this diploma, which is this sort of fudge mudge in the middle, as valuable on paper as a, a, an academic A level. Well, it depends what you want to go on and study. If you want to be a lawyer, if you want to be a doctor, then uh, I don't think the diplomas would be the route for you because uh, the sorts of A-levels, sort of UCAS points, which the universities you might want to go to, um, are not going to want uh, diplomas. And they're not, particularly, they're not going to want the subjects that the diplomas are designed for. Uh, but if you want to be... So you both, you both... Sorry, you both appear to be saying you want to keep this big distinction between academic and vocational and yet you want to muddy it at the same time. But if you want to be an architect, uh, equally if you want to be a bricklayer, you might not be sure what you want to do, but you, you quite like buildings and construction and, and, and engineering and that sort of area, then either the engineering or the construction and the built environment diploma would be for you. And you're not then making your decision at that point as to whether or not you are academic and going for university or whether you are just vocational and going straight off to work yeah. after school. Uh, makes sense, Alison Wolfe. Um, it's the hardest one to square because what you're actually trying to do always is do several things at once. And, and actually, we have been trying to do this now for decades. We've been prattling on about parity of esteem, so you could make everything equally high status. You don't believe in parity of esteem? I think if we could get rid of that phrase, it would be the most useful thing we could do for education policy overnight. You don't value people equally? No, I've, uh, no, that's not what I said. I said you cannot have parity of esteem for everything. That is not how the world works, it's not how any country works, this idea that everybody in France and in Germany thinks all qualifications are of equal use for everything is just is, is garbage. I think the major problem we have with the diplomas is that, once again, we're trying to do too much. We're trying to pretend that they can be everything at the same time and it isn't possible logistically, financially, or in terms of how the world will see them. Richard Wayne, you've been listening to this, representing the CBI and yourself. What do you make of what the proposition is as we've heard it up until now? I think, I mean, employers in general support the principle of the diplomas. Um, what I've got to make clear is I don't think employers from the diplomas are looking for oven-ready employees coming out, of, coming out of school. What they're looking for is a rounded person with perhaps some motivation to go into that particular sector. So it's not about um, uh, specific, really specific skills for a particular occupation. It's, it's more of that rounded person uh, who, who feels they want to go into that particular sector. Karen McAlpine. Well, we've, we've been involved in getting employers and schools together to try to solve some of these problems for young people. And it's been about trying to find what suits the employer and the young person, not just trying to say, well, it's a two-week block or it's a day a week. And we established something that we called an escalator of engagement where employers could jump in and offer their skills. So some were being ambassadors, going into schools and motivating young people. Some were taking people on extended placements, uh, perhaps for two or three months. Some doing a day a week every week for two years to, to improve the lot of young people. Some taking people on apprenticeships. But that's galvanising employers to work with schools. And that, that's made a huge difference. And when it comes down to schools that have got through the gateway, we've got employers' groups sitting down with schools, very local, saying, well, how can we contribute to what's going to happen with those diplomas to make them successful? Chris Pierce at the back. It seems to me that we're constantly talking about two kinds of people. People who are thinking people, who can appreciate thinking and education and art, and people who can appreciate spanners and, and industry. And I would like, as an educationalist, to think that I'm sending young people out into the world with the skills for a trade, with the interest in lifelong learning, who can also appreciate art, music and literature. At the moment, we've got an education system that, because it's so objective-based and assessment-based, it's killed off most people's interest in learning by the time they're 16. Come back in on well, that, John well, well, I will come back on that. Why do we assume that carpenters and plumbers and network engineers and engineers and all kinds of other people don't like art, music and literature? Valuing craft and elevating practical competencies is critically important in our culture. And unless we start doing it, unless we start writing off everyone who's not an academic, frankly, we will not only cheat a generation of people, we'll do our economy and our culture no service at all. Does that meet your point, Chris? No, because you were the person who said you were concerned about academicising vocational courses. Now, that sounds to me like well, you're still trying to have a distinction between thinking people and doing yeah, people. On. Well, let me, let me give you an example. You probably perceive an apprenticeship, as I perceive one, as a willing and eager young learner learning at the side of an experienced craftsman. I heard recently 
that half the apprenticeships in the northwest of England have no employer engagement. No employer engagement. I don't mean no workplace element. I mean no employer engagement at all. That is not a proper apprenticeship because it's because so detached from the real competence that it's supposed to impart that, in my judgment, it ceases to have value. And an apprenticeship taught in a classroom with no workplace element is academicising a vocational qualification to the point where it is valueless. One more go, Chris Pearce. I would support what you're saying, provided it doesn't end up with a situation where you have this great divide between people who go off and learn their skills for the rest of their life in industry, in the workplace, <coughs> and those people who go off to academia. I want working people who appreciate literature, and I want academics who know how to wire their own plugs. I'm going to bring in Simon, who's Simon Binns. You've been very patient. You've had your hand up for a while. But students now are either one way or the other, like a big majority of them. I don't, I don't, I've been in school for quite a good while. I know people that are still in school now. Like, you are either someone that likes to learn and likes to be educated and wants to be in school, or you're not. And I don't think there is an in-between. I don't S think that really Simon, does it, does it worry you if someone says, oh, that person's academic, but that person ha is an artisan and has a different kind of skill or is um, uh, doing vocational work? Does that worry you? Does it, it, doesn't, it doesn't worry me. Like, I think the, the majority of the kids that you speak to, if you ask them, are you someone that likes to do things with your hands and likes to be practical, or are you someone that likes to learn? They'll give you one or the other. They won't. There's, there's not a high majority. There's not a high amount of people that are in between at the moment in schools. I don't think that, that lack both both sides of both sides of it. And if you find them, then you're lucky, I guess, and they're so, going to so, go get so, a nice so, job. So perhaps on this, Mick Brooks, you're, you're sort of tilting at windmills. If that's general, the people don't actually care, and it's the educationists who've got their, their <laughs> everything in a twist about it. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think it's about people's lives, and, and there's, there is more to life than work. It's having that, that engagement in, in things outside the world of work, which is also but, but, what school but, but is I'm, about. But I'm sorry, the, we're just about um, up with our time. Are these diplomas, Alison Wolf? what chances do you give them of achieving their <laughs> objective? One in four, truthfully. Um, I also want to say lots of people do come back when they've got the chance and unfortunately it's getting harder and harder to come back because adult education is losing funding. And I also want to agree with John that if you do want to learn an occupation, you learn it at work. Mick Brooks, what chances of it delivering what you want? It has to work. I, I think that, that, um, that this, this is in a sense a last chance saloon. We are in deep trouble, I think, if this doesn't work. And so we need to, to, to be practical, we need to get together and say, if this is going to be a, a way of moving into the future, how do we make it work? Because I think Jim's ideas are good. It's the practicality of getting there that worries me, uh, which I think okay. has been demonstrated. Quick last word, John Hayes. I wanted, what chances? Work, I wanted to work for the good of young people. I worried that it might not. And unless the government could be absolutely sure this doesn't go off at half cock, they should delay it until it can work properly. Which is why, Minister, no doubt that, as we heard earlier, um, Alan Johnson, your boss, said in this context, it could all go horribly wrong. Uh, he said that in, in responding to a journalist who said, this could all go horribly wrong, and he said, well, some people say it could all go horribly wrong, and he then got misquoted out of context. But um, I think uh, it will go uh, well. We are reaching every one of our milestones so far, uh, and it has to work, as Mick said. Uh, we need it for young people, we need it for our economy. Thank you very much. And there we have to end where we started. In the background, Tomlinson all the way through. Right or wrong, to blend or not to blend academic and vocational education. And whether the Green Paper resolves that issue is perhaps, in the end, the greatest question of all. If you've got any comments that you'd like to make about it, please join the debate online at www.teachers.tv stroke debate. For the moment, from all of us in the studio, panel, audience and me, goodbye. <laughs>